Since the presidential election of 2016, we've seen the rise of what the mainstream media terms fake news, as though news had previously been honest and accurate, until online platforms gave voice to alternative media outlets that circulated stories that were less than accurate and even intentionally misleading. But the British documentarian Adam Curtis had foreseen, if not predicted, the rise of fake news in his 2016 film, Hypernormalization. He describes a landscape where people increasingly look to validate their personal realities in a hall of mirrors of online portals, echoing political voices that reinforce their previously held beliefs. It is perhaps best exemplified in social media technocratic dictatorship of search engine optimization that tailors content to our personal likes, codifying our behavior patterns. But in a world where citizens have been replaced by consumers, monitored and fed content and information to justify old patterns, we're left to wonder, is our reality like the internet, a construct of our own creation? There's a, a phrase that's been part of our culture for a few hundred years. Really, it was the beginning of the Enlightenment, so-called, with Descartes saying, I think, therefore I am. And I tend to th actually challenge that and say, I am, therefore I think. I think, therefore I am is a very indirect way of trying to know who you are. Before a thought occurs, you exist. I am Deepak Chopra as a provisional identity. Uh, I am Sean Stone as a provisional identity because it's been changing ever since you were an embryo or a zygote. From birth to death, you are engaged with a process that we call body-mind, which is experiencing another process that we call the world, but that's not who you are. That's the conditioning of I am, because I am is just existence. I exist, it, that's all it means, without trying to figure out what it is. So there are a couple of things we can be sure of. One is, there is existence. You look around, things exist. You can also say, I exist. And I exist and this existence go together, okay? Because if I didn't exist, I wouldn't have this experience. So now we get into huge issues. What is mind? What is body? What is the universe? And how do we know that these descriptions we have about mind, body, and universe are actually the real thing? So. What is reality? Reality is a species-specific knowing and experience. What you and I have is a human experience in human consciousness. And that experience is basically sounds, shapes, colors, forms, sensations, perceptions, images. The rest is a story. For 30,000 years or 40,000 years, the stories have been mythology, first, stories, religion, second, theology, third, philosophy, fourth, and now science. They're all stories that are basically the interpretation of experience. The human story a hundred years ago was that most people lived on farms, never traveled more than a hundred miles from home, and likely never received news from far off countries. How do we compare that consciousness to that of modern man, crammed into overpopulated cities, connected on social media with strangers from all over the globe, receiving hourly news updates, with access to more books, art, and media, 
than he could ever process in a lifetime. We are, all of us, already are cyborgs. So you have a machine extension of yourself in the form of your, your phone and your computer and all your applications. You are already superhuman. If you have an internet link, uh, you, you have an oracle of wisdom, you can communicate to millions of people, you can communicate to the rest of Earth instantly. I mean, these are magical powers uh, that didn't exist not that long ago. So everyone is already superhuman. We're living in a scientific age, but actually the world looks increasingly magical in the sense that we are communicating with people across the planet that we never have seen in real life. We are under basically the spell or the, uh, the casting, the illusions of various uh, news corporations and media conglomerates that, um, you know, people that we've never met with and reacted with are basically helping to program everything from our lifestyle choices on Instagram to um, our political thoughts and, and ideas. Oh, very much so. Everything is about suggestion. When we look at the, the media, when we look at advertising, when we look at almost everything that we do, the power of suggestion is what is happening. Uh, rarely do we have a direct encounter with something, but there's always an illusion to it. So when we have this uh, capturing of the imagination, which is what a hypnotic induction involves, the capturing of the imagination and directing it in some way, we go with that flow. And we are bombarded all the time by images and ideas and suggestions more so than ever before. It's almost impossible to escape uh, between the pings that come on your cell phone to the images that pop up in the corner of your eye as soon as you go onto your internet browser. Everything is saying to you on some level, look at me, give me attention, uh, give me your life force, your energy uh, in some manner. Smart devices are sort of telepathy with training wheels. You know, it's a way of us to be connected together. And I think the larger, the larger issue there, the larger storytelling point, is that it's activating the hive mind meaning the group mind of the planet or what you know uh, Joseph Campbell called the global human. And I very much believe in the evolution of the global human. And so the, the choice point is, are we going to activate that group mind, that high mind from you know, the, the reptilian brainstem theater of the human mess? Or are we going to actually allow that to be activated from, as Abraham Lincoln said, the better angels of our nature? And I believe that, you know, that uh, augmented intelligence uh, extended intelligence and all these transhuman amalgams that are happening could need to reflect the better angels of our nature and make us become more evolved outside of the primal reality of being an animal. Conscious evolution means that the whole evolutionary process of creation from the origin of you know, the single cells, the multi-cells, the animals, to humans, now to us, we are the first generation to be conscious of the whole process of evolution. And secondly, conscious that we are expressions of evolution becoming conscious. And third, that we have noticed the direction of evolution for billions of years, single cell, multi cell, animal, human, more complexity, more freedom, more complex love, more consciousness. The renowned physicist Stephen Hawking, known for his optimism, recently published his brief answers to the big questions and noted, in a way, the human race needs to improve its mental and physical qualities if it is to deal with the increasingly complex world around it and meet new challenges like space travel and it also needs to increase its complexity if biological systems are to keep ahead of electronic ones. At the moment, computers have the advantage of speed, but they have shown no sign of intelligence. However, the rapid pace of improvement will probably continue until computers have a similar complexity to the human brain. The brain, and I'm holding a plastic model of one in my hand, is a three pound computer made of meat. It's got about a hundred billion neurons in it. Each one on average is connected to about 10,000 other neurons. So that's roughly the number of stars that there are in the Milky Way galaxy. It works through electricity. The electricity is a result of ionic channels, things like salt, but it's slow. The processing in the brain and neural tissue of signals is only about 200 miles per hour. That's not particularly fast. And so when we go to a chip, the speed on a chip is order of magnitudes greater than that. Transhumanism is a philosophical belief that mankind will continue to incorporate technology into its intelligence and physiology. 
far beyond current limitations. The limitation is one of bandwidth. So we're, we're bandwidth constrained, particularly on output. Uh, so uh, our input is much better, but our output is extremely slow. You know, if you want to be generous, you could say maybe it's a few hundred bits per second or a kilobit or something like that output. But, you know, the way we, we output is like we have our little meat sticks <laughs> that we move very slowly. You know, compare that to a computer which can communicate at the terabit level. There's a very big orders of magnitude differences. Stephen Hawking was one who believed the future of communication is brain-computer interfaces. There are two ways electrodes on the brain, and implants. If we can connect a human brain to the internet, it will have all of Wikipedia as its resource. But do you think then that it's inevitable that we're gonna see basically a merging of man with machine, that we're basically gonna to have to uh, figure out basically how the brain functions to a place where we can just download intelligence and data into a machine so that we can prolong our life or expand our memory? Or do you think that there's actually a potential future where we we have machines augmenting our, our technology, but we actually don't merge machinery you know, with nanotech and other things into us. I think that we're gonna merge because I think it's a natural aspect of human evolution. It's just like saying we, you know, we were able to grow cotton, we were able to grow hemp, and then are we gonna wear clothes or just look at them outside of ourselves? Clothing, fashion, all these things have become integral parts of our identity as human beings, both individually and as a group. So this is a much, much more profound aspect of evolution through uh, the expansion of a technology, but there's no way that it's gonna stay outside of us. It's gonna be integrated inside of us. And that's why the stakes are high. There are groups that they can actually uh, somewhat detect what you're thinking. Uh, are you thinking of a shoe or thinking of a, you know, certain patterns uh, by putting electrode uh, not into the brain, just outside uh, from recording of, um, you know, neurophysiological recording. So um, right now we're actually controlling uh, motor function with the brain. There's a project called the uh, Brain Computer Interface. You can actually put an electrode into the brain of uh, amputees and connect that to uh, the robotic arm. So basically when they think they want to move their fingers, this robot moves. So there, now we have actually decoded those signals that can be translated to uh, function. So that field is developing as such that uh, now in technology is being used in Air Force to control the airplane with your thought. Right. Because that reduces the, the, the timing that you have to react with muscles. Right. So we keep getting back to this notion of it's really how you uh, approach your brain, how you basically are act, um, actively engaging with it, which really takes me more to the idea of the power of the mind, that basically there's something that has to do with um, will and choice and decision making that's not just this predictable and programmatic. Is that something that we're finding more and more through brain mapping and neuroscience is that expectations that basically you could control behavior and control patterns and basically control the individual by mapping the brain is not as simple as what was once thought? Experiences that you have emotionally and change your uh, brain, actually. It does, it so, does, neuroplasticity concept. Correct, neuroplasticity, and, and we are all made of, uh, you know, kind of chemical uh, reactions, right? So, and brain is the, the most reactive part of the, uh, the body, and uh, any imbalance in chemical in the brain can change the behavior of the pa patient. I deal with a lot of patients with responsive neurostimulation, which is like a pacemaker for the brain that's placed inside uh, the brain. I think it's very interesting uh, that um, when you stimulate certain areas um, of the brain, you can elicit emotions. You can elicit fear. There are areas in the brain that if you stimulate them, um, you can almost elicit like a feeling of bliss. Uh, for a short time, uh, and that is something amazing. But here's the great mystery. You know, if you, if you take an electrical probe 
and you sort of stimulate the brain, actually you will have certain experiences. You might see images, you might recall a story, you might recall a song that you were hearing, etc. And so that's an argument that the brain produces the experience. Now I can give you the same experience. If, I, uh, if you're reading Shakespeare in a book, you, you can conjure up the world of Shakespeare, right? All that's in the book is squiggles, symbols that correspond to constructs we've agreed on. But when you read a novel, you read a book, you hear a song on the CD, or you see a film, suddenly you evoke experiences because symbolic representations of experience can trigger the original experience. What Dr. Chopra is indicating is the reciprocal nature of the mind and the brain. While we can physically pry the brain or chemically alter it with drugs, our understanding of neuroplasticity informs us we can alter neural pathways and chemical tendencies within the brain based on our activities, including meditation. Studies in trauma are demonstrating that the power of the mind can alter the brain using virtual reality. The concept is that you basically create the context as best as possible for, from the memory of the soldier and basically recreate the event. And by recreating the event, over and over, uh, you're actually uh, releasing the energy of that uh, memory. Typically with people with PTSD, when they're confronted with trigger stimuli in the real world, like seeing trash by the side of the road, which brings back the memory of an IED being hidden roadside, there's activation in the brain that causes this hyper, hyper arousal effect. You know, sometimes you call it startle response or, you know, it's like if you go up to a veteran, put your arm on their back from behind, you see them jump out of their skin. And that, to me, as a neuropsychologist studying brain behavior relationships, uh, really shows how the brain can be tuned by just one big event to have a lifelong impact. And you typically see an overactivation of the amygdala. This is the fight or flight area of the brain. This is what, you know, it's, it's a survival mechanism so that, you know, if there's a real threat, you're ready, ready to go and a whole set of bodily, you know, functions change to prepare you to deal with the threat. So this simulation behind me is one of 14 that make up the brave mind system that we've successfully used for treating PTSD by helping a patient to go back to the scene of the crime in a safe place. They're in the therapy office and to go back and to talk about what they went through and to do this repeatedly under the guidance of a well-trained clinician. And by this process of confrontation and processing, over time, you start to see the activating effects in the brain start to diminish. We call it extinction learning. And in one study with PTSD treatment using VR, uh, it was shown that at the end, if you measure someone before and after treatment, you see less activation in the amygdala, and you also see the, the proper changes you would expect in frontal lobe function. Well, for me, I've always noticed that there's sort of an electrical charge, an energetic charge to memory. Some memories are very charged. That's why we right. tend to be more reactive when we think of it, right? It gives us a real charge. And then sometimes you can actually quell the charge. You can lo lessen it until it gets to the place where it disappears, but that yes. has no charge, and that's when you, you forget about it, right? Short-term potentiation is a short-term memory. Okay, uh, some electricity comes and goes and just, uh, so long term, uh, you basically, you, you build, uh, if the memory is very strong, then all of a sudden you build a, a genetic component toward that uh, particular uh, experience. What does that mean, genetic, why genetic? Meaning that, you know, it, it really become ingrained in the genome of the cell, mm. okay? So when a cell is regenerating, passing the memory to the next one, so now we see the memory is distributed uh, throughout the structures, which is coordinated by uh, the hippocampus. So I think, uh, again, our understanding of memory is developing because our understanding of cellular memory is developing. All of our organs are formed from cells, which are in turn controlled by our DNA, which stores our genetic blueprints including at least some of our ancestral memories. Little wonder then that as Stephen Hawking says, 
there has been relatively little change in human DNA in the last 10,000 years. But it is likely that we will be able to redesign it completely in the next thousand. Well, of course, there's a lot of danger in there, but from an evolutionary point of view, nature has been editing the genetic code for billions of years, and it's been pretty ruthless, which is to say there have been five mass extinctions before we got here. Nature does not preserve species. Nature preserves purpose. So what I think is to be really considered here, I think it's natural that we will be able to improve our genetic code. There is no indication that our genetic code is totally perfect in all its domain and could not be improved. So I think we will do that. As our bodies are formed by our cells, which are the progeny of originator cells known as stem cells, these stem cells are now being studied and used to regenerate organs and tissues. It can only be imagined how gene editing of stem cells may ultimately lead to the redesigning of the human body. Our bodies have stem cells all throughout them. So we have it in our bone marrow, we have it in our fat, um, your liver, you can cut off part of your liver and it will regenerate. Um, and just recently we found out that there are stem cells in your brain, literally every, your teeth, every little part of your body has stem cells in it. And basically as you age over time, these stem cells are what replace damaged parts. So if you have a building and you have plumbing that's bad or electrical that's bad, it's kind of like the repairman that comes along and, you know, redoes everything. So the more stem cells that you have, the more repair you can do, basically recreating the original structure. But then we can get into things of, well, what if I want to function differently? So what if, what if I like your brain cells or somebody else's, you know, Michael Jordan's hamstring cells or his, you know, knee cartilage? And we can get start getting into like designer um, stem cell cocktails. It'd be like going to your local you know smoothie shop and saying you know, I like you know those fruits and mix them all together. But the problem is that it seems to me that is the stem cell of of, a, of an Einstein is not going to make you Einstein because even that stem cell works in the context of, all, of billions of connections. Absolutely, but if all of Einstein's connections are paved in gold, then, and that's what allowed his connections to, you know, flow better, then shoot, start paving some of mine in gold, so, you know, maybe my connections will start flowing better. Stephen Hawking pointed out, the best intention of genetic manipulation is that modifying genes would allow scientists to treat genetic causes of disease by correcting gene mutations. There are, however, less noble possibilities for manipulating DNA. One negative effect of gene manipulation on crops has been the reduction in seed strains now available to us compared to 100 years ago. We should fear such loss of biodiversity to plant, animal, and human life if gene modification goes unchecked. It is for this reason that Stephen Hawking notes, intelligence is the ability to adapt to change. We must not fear change. We need to make it work to our advantage. So the main thing here is that we have a sense of direction of civilization, of inclusivity, of everybody's genius being important. And we have to just increase that as we gain the powers that we used to attribute either to accident or to gods. For some, knowledge of the genome is reminiscent of the apple offered to Adam and Eve by the serpent. For others, the metahuman future is the most natural evolution of all. Technology is an essential tool in mankind's story, but it is up to us to decide how we will continue to assimilate it. That decision will affect not only our minds and bodies, but our universe as well. What we are experiencing is the human universe. We created money, for example. It's a concept, right? Religion. God. God, as we usually describe God, is another construct. Okay, so everything that you can name is either a construct or a creation. Now you'll say this is both a construct and a creation. This is both a construct and a creation. What we don't understand, this is a construct and a creation. Galaxy is a construct and creation. Atom is a construct and creation. Who's yours? The consciousness that I am is tied to the, to the universal consciousness that you tap into, that every other... There is only universal consciousness. Yes. If we really get this, then we will be able <clears throat> one day challenge Darwinian thoughts about evolution because Darwinian evolution says uh, random mutations and natural selection. <clears throat>
I would replace that by unpredictable mutations and natural selections. Randomness means inherently random. So if I go to uh, Grand Central Station, everybody is seemingly randomly going hither and thither, right? But they know where they're going. This yeah. one is going to Philadelphia, yeah. and this one is going to Boston, this one is going to New York. In fact, if I watched them every day, I would be able to plot a graph and create a business plan. Say, this is how this works. Going to the question on your t-shirt, who am I? Essentially, consciousness is infinite, and we can't limit it or understand it, but we, as a thinking thing, have certain limitations. Yes. Now, perhaps, that's self-imposed to some degree, but what, what is it? I mean, isn't there a fa function of the brain or something in the body or something that's limiting us, our consciousness, in this, per this momentary experience that even though we can perhaps tap into a greater consciousness, and we've seen this in experiments of uh, psychic experiments, for example. Psychedelics. And things like this, so that what's the, but what is the actual limitation? What is limiting our consciousness then? The bandwidth of the consciousness. Okay, now these days everybody understands bandwidth, you know, 4G, 2G, whatever, um, which are different ranges of the bandwidth of experience. And that's what's limiting, and human consciousness has been programmed culturally and through religion, culture, science, mythology, and uh, even economic conditions, because, you know, your experience of the world is not that of a starving kid in the gutters of Calcutta. So all that we experience is the conditioned mind and its projections. And that conditioning is very ancient. It goes back to the first time that human beings started to communicate their experiences. What's beyond that conditioning is infinite possibilities, mm -hmm. infinite consciousness. And that's who you are. You are an infinite consciousness having a finite experience. At the dawn of the 21st century, we might know more about the universe than previous generations. But to quote Donald Rumsfeld in one of his more lucid moments, there are known unknowns, but there are also unknown unknowns. The ones we don't know, we don't know. If quantum theory is leading us toward ideas about multiverses and dimensions affecting our reality beyond the fourth, there may be no limit to where our multidimensional consciousness will take us. But there are others who would argue the rules of the universe can be completely known, starting with the brain. In 2014, you might have caught the Johnny Depp film Transcendence, which popularized an idea held by futurists like Ray Kurzweil that one day, humans will be able to upload their brains to computer chips, their ideas, their memories, their identities. At the 200 million or so year history of our brains through mammalian history, we see there's a flaw in the design. And the fundamental flaw of the brain, it has no backup. The most precious information that we have is not backed up. The crudest computer system we have is something we can back up. Now, one of the goals of the National Academy of Engineering in the 21st century is to reverse engineer the brain. And that means, in effect, to back it up. And you get at once a strategy to not just boost intelligence, but to extend life. In the same way that when your old computer starts to run out, you back up the files, the software, and translate it to a new computer. But your belief then fun is fundamental. You believe that we will basically be able to download my awareness, my being, you know, let's say I am, you know, this Sean Stone experience of 33 years, be able to download that awareness into a computer so that I could potentially live forever as 
sort of like a computer or some kind of robot, let's say, or something to that effect? I think for a lot of us, it's hard to imagine living in a computer. And my answer to that is, well, you're living in one right now. It's just made of three pounds of meat. The mind, as best we can tell, is a kind of music, a kind of pattern played by the brain, played by the meat. But it's a very crude instrument. So by improving the instrument, we can still play the same musical tune, those patterns that identify you. Now there are ultimately patterns in a big bit stream, a bunch of ones and zeros, but they're still patterns. So yes, we could play them on different instruments, play them faster, augment them. And in that sense, your whole being, your consciousness, is just a seed, a seed that will grow and expand in ways we really can't foresee when we start to approximate that with the chip. To put it differently, the old saying is that biology is destiny. Nothing can be further from the truth. Biology was just nature's first quick and dirty way to compute with meat. Chips are destiny. You say that the brain itself has individual qualities and patterns that are not necessarily replicable. Like you can't just replicate all the nature of the brain because the cells themselves have, have uh, sort of quantum dynamics going on. There's Correct. something that's, you know, it's very difficult to sort of predict and model especially from moment to moment, there is this notion right. of will, there is a notion of choice. There is no An experience. So yeah. it, you can see that in actual uh, 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 clones. Right now you can clone a human being, but if I clone Sean or Bobak, are we gonna be the same? No, we're gonna look the same, same genomics, but the behaviorally, no, because our behavior is piled up based on our experiences. And those experiences, uh, I'm not at least aware that can be transferred to the memory of our entire cells uh, to be able to actually, when I clone you, you become, a, it becomes really second you. If human experience alters the brain and leaves imprints in the DNA that can be passed on genetically, then we cannot even begin to speculate how consciousness will shift as we merge humans with machines. How will that feel? It would be truly transhuman. Right now, again, we're thinking with brains, with neural systems that process about 200 miles per hour, the electrical signals. But if you were in a chip, the time would speed up millionfold, billionfold. So a few seconds of our current meet time would be, for example, many years. So you could live a very long time, it's still finite, inside a chip, until you ran out of power. And we could go quite a ways on that. The possibility of replicating the human brain will go a long way toward the creation of artificial intelligence. Stephen Hawking believed, evolution implies there can be no qualitative difference between the brain of an earthworm and that of a human. It therefore follows that computers can, in principle, emulate human intelligence. I created something terrible. Artificial intelligence. Stephen Hawking wrote about the promise and peril of artificial intelligence, relaying that yes, AI has potential to eradicate disease and poverty, but he and Elon Musk, along with AI experts, signed an open letter in 2015 calling for serious research into its impact on society. It's a real concern because computers are powerful in their own right. Future supercomputers especially as they shrink, will be far more powerful. We just don't know what that will look like. We have only one good example of intelligence, a sample size of one, and it's us. And what we're talking about achieving, just when we back up, boost, and extend the brain, is a kind of super intelligence. And it's very hard to make inferences. So there, there is a big, scary downside, just in terms of the problems we currently have. One of the fundamental problems we have right now with computer systems is lack of good security. But as we move to the Internet of Things, as almost everything in your house has a computer tie-in, from your microwave oven to the lights, all those are potential sources of hacking, just as is any kind of backup of the brain. And the assault, again, it's, it's much easier to attack than defend in the information age. Stanley Kubrick's 2001 A Space Odyssey featured an artificial intelligence named HAL. 9,000. Howe was in charge of the spaceship and ultimately murdered the crew, which epitomizes the fear of AI, as voiced by Stephen Hawking. The concern is that AI would take off on its own and redesign itself at an ever-increasing rate. Humans, who are limited by slow biological evolution, couldn't compete 
and would be superseded. And in the future, AI could develop a will of its own, a will that is in conflict with ours. For such reasons, the creation of artificial intelligence has often been equated with the invention of the atomic bomb. The analogy to nuclear bomb is not exactly correct. It's, it's, not, it's not as though it's going to explode and create a mushroom cloud. It, it's more like if there were just a few people that had it, they, they would be able to be, be essentially dictators of Earth. Or, or whoever acquired it, and, and, and if it was limited to a small number of people, they were, and it was ultra smart, they would have dominion over Earth. But we're at a moment now where dystopian storytelling and the fear of things like artificial intelligence has become so pervasive that it's actually going to become a self-fulfilling prophecy. And the thing that I think that's most important is to not think of these kind of transhumanist ideas as outside of being human. They're coming from us. Artificial intelligence isn't artificial. It's actually an augmentation. It's augmented intelligence or even extended intelligence from us as humans. So to think of it as something separate that's scary and alien is actually the very thing that will make it so. The idea that now it's AI that's programming AI that's programming AI to me is an excuse. It's an excuse to say, oh, we're not responsible anymore. Screw that. We are responsible. So we're going to create the simulated world that we live in, just like we have since the Industrial Revolution. There's been amazing things about that. It's actually a better time on planet Earth than it's ever been before on so many levels in terms of violence and war and all these things. People think it's such a horrible time. It's actually not in terms of you look at the actual statistics. So we have evolved in a positive direction through our technology. This next level, this next step, is like the step to the Star Child at the end of 2001 A Space Odyssey. That ending of the Star Child is one of the most hopeful spiritual endings in the history of storytelling. And it's very ephemeral, very etheric. It means many things to many different people. But the idea that humans come back and look at our planet from a more holistic view, from the childlike wonder of the star child as the next evolution, that's an incredibly hopeful thing. Stephen Hawking argued, knowing the mind of God is knowing the laws of nature. My prediction is that we will know the mind of God by the end of this century. But first, we should perhaps recall the ancient mystery school dictum, to know thyself. For who truly knows his own mind, his own body, let alone the universe, with each affecting each other more deeply than we recognize? So right now, if people are watching us, and they're listening to us, they're, what humans would call visual cortex is being activated, their auditory cortex is being activated, and what you will see on a CAT scan is neurochemical activity. That neurochemical activity is called the neural correlate of consciousness, or the, another word, neural correlate of experience. There's no experience that is not recorded in the brain, on what we call the brain. By the way, it's, there's no experience that's not recorded anywhere in the body. The body is, the brain is recording the experience, but the brain is sending messages to the body. So there's cellular the, memory, right? Cells, cells are mem remembering is, and interacting. Everything. Yeah. So as long as you have a materialistic interpretation of the universe, where you actually believe that brain, body, mind are real permanent entities, which they are not, mind, brain, and body and the world are shifting perceptual experiences. They are an intermittent stream of sensations, images, feelings, thoughts. All these are human systems of thought trying to interpret experience, which is nothing other than consciousness modifying itself as experience. So there's only consciousness, it's infinite. Most people think uh, that consciousness emerges from the brain acting as a computer, with each neuron in the brain and each synapse, synapse acting as uh, fundamental switches and bits. And that if you get sufficiently complex computation among these simple neurons and interconnections, then consciousness will emerge at a critical level of complexity. I think of the brain more like an orchestra than a computer. 
and uh, you have oper uh, oscillations and vibrations and resonances at these different frequencies. Like in a piece of music, you have uh, high frequency and low frequencies and beats and, and interference patterns and so forth. And the EEG would be the slow beats, uh, whereas we have very fast vibrations up into the, uh, the terahertz. And perhaps even faster in, uh, that we can't detect as yet. And I get a lot of flack for, about that from uh, AI people, but what I say in response is, until you can explain consciousness in the brain, you cannot exclude the possibility of consciousness outside the brain. What is it about the near-death experience or consciousness after death, post-mortem consciousness, that you believe indicates consciousness does not actually originate in the brain, in brain activity? It's impossible that consciousness should be produced by the brain is because we did a prospective study. We found out that 18% of those patients had memories from the period of unconsciousness. They were clinical dead, which means there's no circulation, no breathing, they're unconscious. And at that very moment, they had an enhanced consciousness, a paradoxical occurrence of enhanced consciousness with the possibility of perception, memories, cognition, emotions, etc. So you can corroborate it by asking the, the surgeon, the cardiologist, the nurses, and the family members about what happened and about the moment it happened. Do you have any theory about what the actual nature of the brain is then? If the brain uh, functions as sort of a receiver of consciousness or what role it really plays in relationship to consciousness? Yeah, that's a good and important question. We have asked it ourselves as well. Well, in my idea, and it's not only my idea, one century ago, William jo James has said it as well, that the uh, brain has a filter function or a transceiving, transmitting function. So to understand it, I could, would love to compare it with the worldwide communication. At this very moment, also you, where you are now and where I'm here, there are hundreds of thousands of telephone calls, calls going through us, through walls, etc. but you meet, need an instrument to receive a phone call. And the phone call is not produced by your mobile phone. This comes back to this question about you talking about the, the mind being a sort of a, more of a symphony, more of a yes. musical waves and getting into the quantum nature of our reality, right? Which is, yes, at one level, um, people have predictable patterns and there are things that, you know, from a biochemical perspective can be predicted, but there is also this notion of our ability to be wrong, our ability to be counterintuitive, right? To go against our own systems of logic and rational behavior, which gives us what we would consider, you know, the human expression, right? And creativity. Exactly. So do you feel that if we increasingly merge with machinery, we actually may be diluting the human potential for creativity simultaneously because it becomes, it really becomes programmatic? I think this will enhance creativity. I think shifting from meat to computers only amplifies the properties we currently have, good and bad, including the creative leaps. And if you again think about something like music, you have to ask yourself, a brain that's backed up on a chip that would be the equivalent of a 50 pound brain today, what kind of musical patterns would it come up with? In other words, what, what would it sing in the shower? Would we even be able to recognize or appreciate that? If you look, for example, at classical music, the, the works of Johann Sebastian Bach, you'll see a lot of what are called fugues, which have three or four independent voices. And that's about as much as we can handle from the brain and listening to it. But what kind of fugue would you get from a 20 pound brain? There might be 15, 20 voices working in parallel to achieve some overall global musical pattern, quite of immense beauty, but we can't even begin to imagine what that would be like. So I think creativity will benefit. It can be argued that creativity has already benefited from technological innovations that allow millions of hours of content to stream to the individual, making our consciousness increasingly trans-dimensional. But all of these virtual worlds invite the question, is this reality simply a computer-generated simulation? Elon Musk has answered that there's only a one in billions chance that it is not. From what we know about the real world, all it is is a bunch of physical energies and we have transducers, eyes, ears, tongues, that take physical stimuli and translate it into a perception. And some people have made the case, well, the virtual reality or the real world, there's not much difference. It's the brain processing stimuli and creating a perception. Everything about this reality 
is a simulation from the standpoint that our brain is taking sensory signals, interpreting them, and there's actually a almost one second delay in how we are perceived. So there actually is no actual now, now, now. It actually is something we're perceiving with what is in technology called a transport latency of almost a second. That means it's a simulation from the standpoint of perception. And if you look at what's happened in uh, you know, quantum mechanical theory and the way in which particle physics has sort of addressed these issues of the perspective of the experimenter being more important than almost any other aspect of the experiment, now you're really having almost empirical uh, substantiation of this idea of simulation theory at the particle level. So when you've got that reaching towards us from the other side, from both sides, I think you've really got to really think there's something very plastic or uh, fluid is a better word about the perception of reality. And I think that even cinema for me, as you know, cinema is one of my, one of my uh, religions, cinema is just a reflection to us of you know, the emotional states of being human in this artificial, in this artifice. Why does it work that we could go cut, 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 and then we think of that as reality? Because the brain creates that into a simulation that gives us the entire emotional experience of what the filmmaker or what that cinematic expression is trying to create. That's why I talk about virtual reality in such uh, intense terms, in terms of a, an ethical framework around this medium, because the emergence of, of virtual experience, what I call VX, and transhumanist uh, modification, that really is becoming what the perception of being a human will be all about. We won't, we'll have generations that aren't thinking of being a human in the same way as someone who grew up you know, on a farm in Iowa who was able to walk from one farm to the other, and that was their daily understanding of life. This is going to be, you're going to, the human imagination is going to be able to range free. And the fact of that, I think, is a tremendously positive thing, because if we can absolutely evolve the human imagination, that's always where our greatest levels of expression have come from. But if we control the human imagination with this amalgam of things, that's where we get into, you know, fascism. In one of his most dire warnings to us, the optimist Stephen Hawking says, a world where only a tiny super elite are capable of understanding advanced science and technology and its applications would be, to my mind, a dangerous and limited one. I seriously doubt whether long-range beneficial projects such as cleaning up the oceans or curing diseases in the developing world would be given priority. Worse, we could find that technology is used against us and that we might have no power to stop it. There is a threat to the human race in misuse of these awesome powers. And so to deal with that, we have to become more conscious in our modality of choosing it under a democracy. So yes, it's dangerous, and that means we have to become more conscious. Now, on the positive side of it, I've always thought that Earth is giving birth to a universal humanity. I've always thought that as we heal the Earth and free ourselves here from hunger, disease, and war, we're going to discover that we can go beyond the planet. So it is necessary if we are to fulfill the destiny of evolution within us to have the power of the artificial intelligence, nanotech, biotech, quantum computing, and all of that requiring us to have a deeper spirituality, requiring us to, what I feel about conscious evolution is the impulse of evolution going to get greater consciousness, freedom, and love for billions of years. You could say a man's purpose is to expand his ability to love, her ability to love. What does that mean? Is there a quantifiable way of assessing our ability to love? Or I mean, how, because obviously love is a very qualitative experience, it's a very personal thing. So is there any way to quantify that, uh, the expression of expanding love? The way nature takes jumps from disorder to higher order is through connecting separate parts to make a new whole greater than the sum of the parts. So as a system gets dysfunctional, all these innovations in different fields arise and just take it right here on planet Earth. 
we have innovations in health, education, economics, etc. At some point, there is a tendency in nature for everything that rises to converge. And I am assuming that the convergence of what's emergent is possible, can be facilitated. And as that happens, the culture of Homo Universalis doing this is so much greater than the sum of our parts that we will know how to heal the earth, free the people, and explore the universe. In the words of Stephen Hawking, this is not the end of the story, but just the beginning of what I hope will be billions of years of life flourishing in the cosmos. Truly, there is no limit to consciousness nor the potentials of human creativity. So to answer the question, who creates reality? We do, by our choices and our perceptions. We not only change our brains and our DNA, but the universe around us. One final question, what do you think is our purpose then, in terms of if we are really this consciousness that's constantly playing tricks on itself, essentially? Our purpose, I think, is to give meaning to existence. And once we give meaning to existence, and once we agree on it, it becomes our reality. And till such time that somebody comes along and says, you know, that meaning was not quite accurate, there's a bigger meaning. And it goes on and on, because consciousness is infinite, we never get to the fundamental meaning of existence, only that which we impose.